So I have a real fun one in my interview series for you today. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Brittany Bennett, who's a mental health counselor in New York, and she has a lot going on that I think you, my listeners, would love to hear about. So the reason that she and I found each other, so funny. I don't know her other than this uh, podcast interview. And I had put out into the interwebs that I was looking for people to do podcast interviews with. And uh, honestly, if you're a listener and you're interested, certainly look me up, Dr. Natalie at learntolovyourstory.com and send me an email and hey, Let's, let's, let's do it. But I, what I uh, find so funny about how she and I found each other is it was all in the title of her book. So she has an ebook and a, a print book, um, short, sweet, what she calls a pocketbook called Selfish is the New Selfless. And if you know me and you've been listening to me for any time, one of my online courses is called Selfish is the New Selfless, or it's part of the, the, the series that I used um, in my 20-week group coaching packages. And so I just thought that was so funny. So she looked me up, she DM'd me and uh, hey, the fruit of that labor of us getting a chat on the DMs is that you're going to get to listen to a little bit about Brittany Bennett and what she's doing. And I can't wait for you to hear. I know your deep, dark secret. You don't like your life. You're a woman in midlife. And for the past two decades or more, you've poured yourself in to other people. You've poured yourself into your career, your family, and yet on the inside, you feel broken. And that's no way to be. I'm Dr. Natalie Marr. I'm a clinical psychologist and a life transition expert. It wasn't too long ago that I was in your shoes, waking up in my early 40s thinking I've got two failed marriages and I'm a single mom for the second time in my life. And I just knew that I could do better, that I could feel better. Fortunately for you, I have about 20 years experience clinically. And so I've created a method that will help you learn to love your story. I know that the story that you're telling yourself about your life feels awful. And I know that you think that you can't change that. I assure you, you can. And when we work together, I'm gonna help you to craft a different story, a story that you love, a story that makes you wanna get up every single day. Let me introduce you to Miss Brittany Bennett. Brittany is a New York State licensed mental health counselor who enjoys sharing her insights into mental health well being in a speaker and reader friendly format. She thrives most in her field, providing well rounded education and guidance through thought provoking discussion and writing, which have been featured internationally. Brittany is the author of the modern self-care book, Selfish is the New Selfless. Love this name. And this book is a reminder of the power of taking care of ourselves first. My whole thing is called Learn to Love Your Story. And so I want to know what your story is. So tell us about Brittany Bennett and tell us from, you know, knee high to a grasshopper on. What's your story? Tell us about yourself. Hmm. That is a loaded question. Um, and one I definitely was not expecting. It's so interesting. And it's so funny how certain questions can can pull at, at the heartstrings. And I, mm -hmm. I almost even feel a little bit emotional even thinking about it because you think to yourself, what would be relevant or a value or I'm not really sure. I, and honestly, Dr. Natalie, I've never even been asked that question. Um, and I probably, I probably dreaded that question. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But well, you know I mean, you tell us what you want us to hear, but here's what I'll say about stories. They're all powerful and they're mm -hmm. all, it, all of them have value and bring value. And so your story is also a story that one of my listeners has and will hear and say, oh my gosh, she's say she's speaking my my whole life to me <laughs> over the, you know, whatever they are, the webs, uh, as it were. Mm -hmm. She's telling me a story that I've heard before. And so I think it's powerful for us to just get grounded in our own humanity and our own likeness to one another. We have so much more 
um, about us that's the same than we do that's different. And mm-hmm. I think when we start to hear people on podcasts and see people on YouTube videos and see people that are authors, we're like, oh, psh, they're, you know, beyond reproach. They're not like me. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. We have all the same woes, I promise mm-hmm. you. And there's just something very powerful and grounded, I think, about starting from that point. But you share with us what, what it is that you think that my listenership could hear today from you. It's a very peaceful um, response that you had for that. So I thank you for that. It's meaningful Mm -hmm. to hear you explain it in that way. And I do just want to share quickly that analogy of the iceberg where you just see the tip and then underneath the water is the whole big bulk of it that we don't Mm -hmm. see. I'm very much on, you know, being human and speaking how we really feel with purpose. Um, But I think what I would probably like to share after hearing your really grand breakdown about the value of sharing maybe a little bit of life story is I can be 100% honest with my whole life ever since I was a kid, I was very, uh, what would maybe a little bit of a, of an independent by choice loner. I've always more so just done my best being independent, um, family would probably say I'm a little opinionated outside of my therapist lens, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I really think growing up while being so independent, I think it may have been a little bit forced and I embraced it. I grew up mainly by myself um, as an only child. um, And I lived with my grandparents for a little bit. And I think that that difference in generation um, being raised by people that were older really kind of set in stone my values and my morals. And my grandma, my whole life would always say, here it comes, just a little bit of emotion, but um, okay. she, would always, she would always say, you know, like, take care of yourself first. You're the most important person. It's all about you. And I think subconsciously, you know, I just kind of really embrace the importance of taking care of yourself and it's okay to put yourself first. You have to do what makes you happy. So I think that combined with being a loner and really having to embrace my environment of being alone and living with older persons, if you will, I have naturally just been attracted to alone time. I really value my alone time. And as I've transformed into adulthood, um, even in my early 20s, like I would go to the movies alone. I loved the peace and quiet of just watching a movie in silence and not being interrupted. I love sitting in silence and staring out in the open, whether it's outside or a wall. But I truly am a thinker. I'm a very existential constantly thinking in the deeper layers of thoughts. Um, And sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming if you have no one to share that with, which Mm -hmm. I find is the majority of the time. Not a lot of people like to go there, but I can most certainly tell you that as it translates into my work as a therapist, I'm very much hyper aware of the deeper thoughts that might come up that no one's even sharing. And that's one of my favorite parts about therapy and working as a therapist is kind of planting the seed of, I wonder why you feel that way. Or I wonder mm-hmm. what's making you think about that right now or a change in direction and thought process. Has anyone ever shared that with you? Or how does that person make you feel about the way that you feel, right? Like it's always the yeah, deeper layers. Yeah. And I really believe it was my lonesome upbringing <laughs> of sitting with your own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And really, even though I didn't have someone to talk to about it, I talked to myself a lot internally. And as I've grown into an adult, sometimes I find myself talking out loud, which is helpful for me. It gets my thoughts more clear. But that I would say in a nutshell, my whole life until I really got into my career and started making colleagues that are now friends, um, I've been very much independent. I've embraced it. And I have a hard time deviating from that sometimes, even when I enjoy more wholesome experiences with others around me. Mm-hmm. Well, a- a- what's so beautiful about it is then you used your superpower, which can also be a vulnerability, right? Your superpower can make you a great therapist because you're very dialed in and you use your self as your instrument of the work so you can check in and kind of know hmm, there's a question under a question here that's not getting asked or not being talked about. And so I can dig further. But then, right. you know, on the other side in our personal lives, sometimes those very, you know, powerful skills as therapists are vulnerabilities, things that are just kind of softer spaces for us in our personal lives. Cause we do like to be alone a little bit more. We don't seem to, you know, have that same kind of 
I don't know, extroverted lifestyle that some other people culturally value. I don't always culturally value that. I think that there's beauty in all expressions, but yeah, I get that. I totally get that. That's beautiful though. And your grandmother was a sage woman. (laughs) (laughs) Like take care of you is not something that traditionally is handed down woman to woman. Right. And if we, in that if, generation, yeah, especially, exactly. If, especially if we've been kind of taken by that cultural upbringing of be a human doer, um, the uh, Emily and Amelia Nagowski wrote a book called Burnout, and I talk I about it burnout. a lot on my yeah, mm-hmm. I've talked about it a lot on my podcast and and in other ways, but it, they talk about it like the oh, what is their phrase human giver syndrome. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, I like it. I just like that way of phrasing it because we do we get acculturated to be human givers to our detriment sometimes. So that was some sage wisdom that that woman had for you early, early in your life. That's beautiful. It does fascinate me. I wish she was still here to be able to talk about it with her, you know, as an adult now. Um, But I did dedicate my book to her. And I would also like to say that the publication date was the date of her and her husband's anniversary, my grandfather. I'm just kind of, yeah, because they really both were the ones who raised me together. And I just love that little nod. And the whole uh, concept of the book is we cannot be our best for others if we're not our best for ourselves first. And again, to your point, that was all. all We can start with the book because. Uh, your title is amazing. I have my, so I have an online course just to kind of give you a little bit background of me. I have an online course called learn to love your story on my website, learn to love your And my fourth course is on self, uh, um, self care, just kind of revamping even your whole idea of self-worth and, and why it is that we need to give ourselves self care. The original title that I had within my group coaching was selfish is the new selfless, which is why I had a blog about it and I had recycled that and like yeah so I'm like well your book's amazing (laughs) I am writing a book so I'm excited that you've written a book I would like to talk a little bit about that today obviously it's probably a culmination of like all your favorite things like you've said I was floored to see your title of of that blog I said wow how incredible is that that pretty much the exact wording aside from the little hyphen that I have in there that little dash which is really what represents what selfish is and new selfless is. I have had a couple, um, actually that's not necessarily true, not a couple. I've had one person whose feedback was based on the title itself, not related to the content of the book. They saw the word selfish and they still associated with what it would be in a dictionary, if you will. And I asked them if they would be willing to just kind of give me just a moment to explain the concept of selfish is the new selfless. And I have self-ish. And in the book, in the first couple of pages, I do spend time breaking it down what the definition is. I look at self by itself, which is connections to thoughts and feelings. And ish simply means being or connected to. And when you put those words together, my little famous tagline is, it gives a whole new meaning to the word selfish, positive, encouraging, embrace to put yourself first. So I really almost kind of wish I could put a little disclaimer, but that was just one person. Um, And all feedback is very useful and valuable. And from that feedback, now I make sure that I spend time sharing what my definition of self-ish is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. There's so many things to love, but I really love that you break down that definition because words are so powerful and they, you know, kind of warp into pulp pop culture's version of what that word should mean. And so there's certainly a connotation we give to selfish. My play on words with it was different than yours, but I love it that you break it down to, you know, just the core, what's the core meaning of this word. And let's, let's kind of use that to our own advantage. I like that. That's great. Tell us about your book then. Let's just go there. No, I think the takeaways I would like is it is super small. I call it a pocketbook guide because I do feel like it could fit in your back pocket. And I wanted there to be a light at the end of the tunnel. I know for myself, I'm a huge genre of suspense thriller books, and they can be 300 pages and I will read it. But if it's something that is more of a different genre, like a self-help or self-love, self-care, I do want it to be short and sweet and to the point. So I really Mm -hmm. took a lot of attention to making sure that it was full of jam-packed information about self-care and mental health well-being. And I tried to be careful with it because I didn't want it to feel like it was mental health and therapy. But I took every day 
ups and downs, victories, and what someone might refer to as a failure, which I think is a great place to start for misdirection, right? But everyday right. examples um, that are full of value to talk about the self-care that falls behind all those ups and downs and uh, conflicts and things like that. Um, but I really also like to share that I wrote it in a way where it feels more like a conversation that mm-hmm. the author myself is talking to the readers if we're talking to one another. And the other key point that I right. like to hit on is I did my best to write it in a way where someone doesn't have to go grab a dictionary or Google something. So there's really no clinical jargon, if you will, no clinical terms. Um, and I want it to be an easy, fast paced read. And the couple of points that I hit on, I call one, the pocketbook guides to the heartfuls and three, the random stuff. And the pocketbook guides are centered on communicating with purpose, with intention, and feeling okay to do the things that are in your best interest without all the guilt attached to it and what to do with that Mm -hmm. guilt if you do have it. And then the heartfuls is my favorite special section, which is really dedicated to talking about what therapy is, how therapy should work, what the function of it is, what the purpose of it is, the value of therapy. And then it breaks down a couple different things of how to take care of ourselves, but also how to support our loved ones who might also be going through a mental health condition. And then finally, the random stuff is as random as it gets. It's exactly what it says. Talks about preparing for jobs, careers, interviews, college versus no college, which if you open up that discussion, we'll be here for days (laughs) because I'll talk about how I really feel about it. But just a lot of fun little stuff. And like I said, short and sweet. Okay. I like that digestible though is useful. I, and, and our, our hustle culture probably is going to get a wider, you know, consumer of your book then. And, you know, you always hope if they start to read your stuff, then they start to follow you as well. So then there might be more for you to give them to follow. But I think that that's wise. I, you don't want to have something that's a, a Dostoevsky novel <laughs> level <I agree laughs> of content because totally. nobody's going to nobody's gonna hold on to that. So honestly, it's one of the reasons why I like to do this podcast because it's bite size, right? Like everybody yes. has about a half hour of time that they can give to something and uh, in their commute or whatever else. And, and that's about as much brain power you and I both know that's about as much brain power and attention we can give to something anyway to yes. digest it and then consume it and put it into our stuff so that makes sense that you made it short and sweet tell us about the title and tell us why you chose that title or that genre to think about sure so I just personally feel that there's such a negative spin on that word selfish and there's so much value in putting ourselves first. That whole concept of we cannot be our best for others if we are not our best for ourselves mm-hmm. really gives you the permission to say, hey, if I want to be present to go do this or if I want to be able to be a part of that, I need to feel my best first. And I also think that there's a lot of value in learning how to say no um, without having to add an explanation why. I'm really big on it's okay to say no, thank you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't have to go beyond that. No, thanks. It doesn't work out for me. Thank you so much for the invitation, but I decline. But we get so caught up in this pressure to explain ourselves and we organically develop a little bit of pressure or self-pressure, maybe a little bit of anxiety about not committing to something or pulling out of something. And I really think that if we can be authentic with, it's just not going to work out for me this time, or I just can't commit to this right now and just leave it at that. Yeah. That's totally acceptable. And then Mm -hmm. also I'm really, really big on choosing who deserves to know. I cannot say that with more on behind it, right? Like who deserves to know? You do not yeah. have to give anyone an explanation, especially if you don't feel a good connection with that person. It's okay to just give a response and not have to get in a conversation about the why behind it, unless you truly yeah. want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell me why that you think that's so important to you. Growing up, being made to feel that I was in the wrong or mm-hmm. tried to make maybe perhaps experiences growing up as, as a kid of feeling uncomfortable for having a certain interest or something that I want to do or a goal or something like that. And I don't want anyone to derail me with their input if it's not supportive to me and what I'm working towards, if it's safe and in my best interest, right? So speaking, I'm an overall healthy person, um, 
So if there's something I want to do and I feel good about it, like for the book, for example, I told very, very few people that I was writing a book and I was met with a lot of uh, surprise for lack hmm. of a better word. That might be a little bit amb- uh, ambiguous for a reason. A little yeah, bit of surprise. Well, that's of, okay. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't tell me. Why didn't you tell me? Versus that's wonderful. I can't believe you didn't tell me, right? There's two different tones there. And I yeah, did not definitely. want to be met with people. I don't like that title. Or did you think about changing the title? Um, what's the concept? No one wants to read a self-help book. And I always kind of chuckle over that because If you don't connect with it, it's simply not meant for you. It's like television shows or music, or if you had something to eat and you did not like that food, it's just not for you. It's okay. Move forward, continue on. And I'm very selective with with conscious effort of Mm -hmm. who I share things with and why I'm sharing these things with them. And equally as is valuable why I'm not um, because I don't want to be derailed. I'm here. We live one time. I want to enjoy my time with as much peace and quiet as I can. And I try to filter out the noise or the distractions that don't bring me value to my life. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's difficult. I still have that very much internal struggle of, am I making the right decision by not having someone in my, in my life or not? Um, but again, we live here one time and we can always choose to change our mind. Yeah. And I think that's what brings me comfort just because I'm not going to share some something with someone now. It doesn't mean that I can't change my mind down the road. No, of course not. I, the, my curiosity rose because it, so Selfish is the new selfless. I love this title because I used this title as part of one of the um, online courses that I teach on self-care. And I put self-care into two general categories at the top of it. So one is, you know, shoring up your energy. So boundaries around our energy and one is refilling or replenishing our energy. We're a finite resource, but we're also able to replenish resource over time. And so kind of those are the two general categories that I start with. And this idea of like, I don't have to tell you, I don't need to give you reasons. I don't, I get to do what I need to do. I don't have to fill you in or give you the, you know, play by play for that all reminds me of those boundaries, right? Like those are important categories. That's a hugely important category in our self-care is to have some boundaries around what is best for us and how we hold our energy in. And I think that especially for women and, you know, I work with women in midlife specifically, there's been an eroding of those boundaries over time that go to things that seem selfless, that Mm -hmm. seem like the acculturated, the acculturated versions of what we should be doing. And so, you know, I need to explain this to my spouse and I need to explain this to my kids and I need to explain it to the team at work or to the ladies at church or whatever this category is, because somehow our time stops being our time and it starts being somebody else's time and our job and obligation is to them and not to us. And so reorienting, I think back to, which is why I use the idea of selfish as the new selfless. I want us to think of these old, you know, like what we would have thought of as culturally selfish behaviors. I want us to put selfless into that category because I think it's the most selfless act when we put ourselves first. It's honestly the toughest for women who really are following that cultured version of themselves where they're a human giver (laughs) and they have that human giver syndrome. It's hard to set those boundaries. It's hard to say, you know what? I I don't owe you anything. I don't owe you an explanation of why Mm -hmm. I want to do what I want to do here. I, I just know it's right for me. And that's all there is to that. I don't need to say anything more. Mm -hmm. I love the way that you worded all that. Oh, thanks. Thank you. It's, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we're in the same business, so we see it here and there and everywhere. Like self-care is, uh, self-care has been a capitalized marketed commodity instead of what it really should be, which is like the important, most important intervention in our day to day practice. Because if there isn't us to go around, then what are we bringing to the world? Not a ton, right? right. You know, if we, if we aren't replenished, then that we're not bringing the best of ourselves and the version of ourselves that we're bringing is, is marred down by all of the 
layers of things that we think that we're obligated to have to do. Isn't so, that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. What inspired you to become a therapist? Tell me about that. I love this question. And it's the same answer every mm-hmm. single time, which of course it is. Um, but this is the the full blown truth. I was a young, a young one. I was probably, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And the movie Harriet the Spy came out, uh, which has Rosie O'Donnell, and Michelle movie. Trachtenberg. Yeah. Yes. And I saw that as a kid. <laughs> And this is probably the the biggest shocker is I don't think most people would even consider this part of the film, but it was the first television slash film I had ever seen that showcased therapy. She, the main character meets with a psychologist and I had never seen this profession before in my life. Right. And I was a kid and all I thought when I saw that was how special is it? to be able to meet with someone to share your thoughts and your feelings in a quiet, private space. That's what I took away from it. Um, And I thought to myself, I would love to be that person for somebody Mm -hmm. else. And really from there, I knew that I would be a therapist, but in, in which capacity that most certainly has changed over time throughout my young adolescence, my late teens, and even my early 20s. And now I'm finally in the space where I belong because I want to be. I thrive with what I do now. And it was just exposure to different facets, if you will, and behavioral health and therapy where I really found where I do my best work because it's what I want to do. Discussion is where my heart is at. I could talk about therapy a lot and I'll never get tired of it. I love, <laughs> and then Can you I, share I a nervous. little bit about that journey with us? Cause I always think sure. that's so interesting. And, and there, I mean, people who aren't in the business, it's, it's a little hard to describe, but there is, there is such a vastness. It's like going into medicine. I imagine, mm. um, you know, like there's, you could specialize in the kind of people you work with and the kinds of work that you do with those people. There's all yeah. kinds of ways that you can go. And so training obviously brings us in, in that more generalist perspective and and our journeys usually are over the course of the time that we do work. And then we kind of get into our niche over time. And so I'm just curious, like, what was that journey like for you? I can't tell you why, uh, but I've always loved suspense, thriller, true crime, documentaries, docuseries, since I've been a little girl. Like, I love CSI growing up, the original when it came out. And I really enjoyed, back in the day, the movie Silence of the Lambs with Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins. And of course, you know, I like to say, take it with a grain of salt, because of course, then you can start to pick apart, well, what did you like about that film? Why did you gravitate towards it? But again, I was I mean, like Harriet the Spy and Silence of the Lambs, very different, but hey, (laughs) we all get to have all the things that we like. (laughs) Isn't that too funny? It is So, (laughs) So I saw a different facet of therapy, if you will, or psychology, right? Anthony Hopkins character, very psychological. And through that, when I was a teenager, when I saw that movie, I actually thought that I was going to end up working as a therapist within prisons. And my whole hope was to work with those that were going to be released out on parole. And I wanted to work with them for at least two to three years prior to their release date, um, if they knew a, a release date or if they had the potential to, to come out, because I wanted to be able to be a support to them to be up to date on technology, um, current oh, events, how to explain, yes, how to explain their charges, their felony. Why hire me? Why hire me after you know about my, you know, poss- if they did find out about that they were in prison or something like that. And I, I'm, you know, it's so wild because if something tragic happens to us individually, we support ourselves and our family members, right? In our own experience with tragedy, crime, loss, violence, hardships. But that person who's responsible for causing the crime, for lack of a better term, Mm -hmm. they have loved ones too. And Mm -hmm. their loved ones will sometimes support them too. And there's people who don't understand that. I could never support someone who hurt somebody or someone who causes crime. 
But at the end of the day, we do have connections with people, good or bad. And I do believe that all people are deserving of support because even someone who's responsible for something horrific, if they are humane, um, they may be regretful, remorseful. They may want to change their life for the better. And even though you can never undo a, a tragedy, you can live better even for yourself, even if it's not for the family that you hurt. And I think that there's so much importance in still feeling <sighs> it's hard to explain but you still have to have a level of human in you to keep yeah. going right to just even yeah keep going and, and I, there's so much I would love to dissect in that but what I will say is it follows this idea of self-compassion that I talk about a lot is that you know we get to have made mistakes and we get to grow. Like yeah. there's nothing there. It, there that We don't need to serve a life sentence for the mistakes that we've made in our life. And so what a beautiful idea to help these folks, you know, coming out of a situation where they've served a, like a legal and cultural you know, per, you know, punishment for something that they've done or accountability for what they've done, but you know, like, okay. And now that's done. Like, and sure what's next, right? Like you also get to have grace and move on in your life here and deserve that. And if you're, a, if you're attached to the version of you that, that paid the price or did the deed and paid the price, then how can you really move on? Like you do need somebody to help kind of give you some more things to be able to hook on to into the future version of yourself. I love that. I love that idea. That's great. So that's what you wanted to be doing. Is that something similar to what you are actually doing now? No, not at all. So, so I got huh? to intern at a few different prisons um, in my early twenties and you know, I, there's really not much to say about it other than once I was in there, I just found it wasn't for me. I did mm -hmm. not, enjoyed the experience in the way that I had hoped I would connect um, being in that environment and to each their own. But it, it very quickly, I knew it wasn't for me. I didn't have to give it any more time. I figured I can, you know, help in other ways as a consult if I wanted to, things of that nature. And fast forward after I did my internship and I went into the community clinics of the world, you know, you do see, um, most diagnoses in that big book, the the DSM. And I love yeah, to talk yeah. about the DSM for just a moment. I don't yeah, sure for, for listeners who either know what it is. And for those who don't, the DSM, the Diagnostic of Statistical Manual is the big book that we use to try to figure out if somebody's experiencing traits or symptoms of a common diagnosis or an uncommon diagnosis. And if people can tolerate it, if I feel like they can, or I ask them, I like to pull out that big book and show it to them because it's so big and it's so intimidating. And at first glance, you're thinking like, holy, you know, holy smokes. Like, that's a, that's a <laughs> big book. There's a lot going on in there. And I really think that it's very valuable to say it's so big because that's how much common mental health yeah. experiences we have. That book is designed to hopefully fit every type of situation in our life that's causing us some type of difficulty or challenge to capture that, to say, okay, hey, we have something here. Let's work with this. You are mm -hmm. experiencing some traits or some symptoms of depression or anxiety. Let's get a hold of this now before it becomes a full blown taking over your life, right? And I think that that book is just the perfect example of hey, whatever you're going through is in here. And I like to point out little tiny things like there's even things in the DSM of d challenges with jobs, challenges in the workplace, um, loss of career, um, retirement, changes to retirement, um, someone who is having challenges with connecting with spirituality or culture or, um, you know, religion. And that, that stuff, all the way to things that maybe other people have heard, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, psychotic disorder, substance use, right? So it really covers everything from small things to big things, common things to uncommon things. Working in a mental health clinic, a community clinic, I saw a lot of different diagnoses. And through that, 
coupled with life experiences that people were sharing coming into the office, I was really able to decide for myself what life experiences that someone's going through that I feel that I do my best work in. I was able to find that I connect most with providing support and insight and psychoeducation to family members who have a loved one with a mental health condition that's impacting their loved one's life and nice. trickling down into the life of the family member. Because unfortunately, family members are not often invited to be a part of their loved one's therapy, treatment, counseling, medication management. And they get lost with either not seeing progress or not understanding what progress looks like or not believing that somebody's experiencing a symptom that they do or not understanding the diagnosis. And one of my classic examples I like to give is when people think of depression, they think of people crying, unable to get out of bed, maybe suicidal, but there's other symptoms too. Feeling guilty. I love to share that. Guilt is such a tremendous depth of disappointment frustration, self-loathing, confusion. And that is a symptom of depression amongst many others, you know, changes in concentration, fatigue, irritability, the list goes on. And I love to be able to spend time providing insight into all the possible things that add up into a possible diagnosis. And moreover, how to support those loved ones, including ourselves, you know, and and conversations, just having discussions around how can you engage or talk to your loved one with showing your support, but in a way that's going to be helpful to them. Having those conversations of, you know, I want you to know that I care about what you're going through. I want to better understand what you're experiencing because I know what I see as a family member, but you might be feeling differently. I would really like to understand if what I see is how you feel and to give you the opportunity to teach me what you're going through, right? There's uh, that would be ideal. But instead we hear you don't have it that bad. What are you talking about? You know, you got a roof over your head or you got a good paying job. What do you, so, you know, you get all those little tiny things, but there's so much more that's going on. And I always love to say people do not what we're going, people do not know what we're going through unless mm-hmm. they ask. And if we're willing to tell them the truth, right? That's like that right. example of, Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. How are you? But inside you like, like that iceberg, you look fine, but underneath, there's all these layers of challenges and hardships. And if you catch us on a good day, we're doing fine. And if you catch us on a bad day, you know, you can ask somebody something and they tear up or it's emotional yeah. or they don't want to talk about it or they're angry or, and it comes out as frustration. Um, so, yeah, so where I stay and where I'm housed probably for the rest of my time here, whether that's, uh, you know, tomorrow's my last day or another 40 years on this planet, I will spend my time providing support to loved ones who want to better learn how to support their loved ones so that they can also help themselves. That's a lovely, lovely agenda. I think I, I, not very many people do that actually within our industry. We're, we're a lot more concerned about the primary uh, yes. clients and not those secondary people. But um, I, you know, it, as in my private practice, I'm a trauma therapist. And so I work with people who've been through interpersonal trauma. I can tell you there's a ton and <laughs> of clients that need your help in that context, right? Because there's lots of secondary trauma that can happen to the people in the folks that I work with in the lie in their lives. Um, and they need the, they need the help too. So I like, I love that. What a interesting thing though, to go from the forensic side to like, Oh yeah, there's still, still the same vein. Right. But it's not yes. exactly the same thing. I love it. I act as a consult too, with people that are starting out in private practice. And one of the first questions I'll ask them is what are the types of clientele that you hope to work with? what do you like to work with? And you'll hear people who have depression or I want to help people who have anxiety or panic disorder. But I don't want to say most people, but a lot of people already have that stuff going on. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. And even if you don't get the full-blown diagnosis, you're certainly going to have traits, you know, throughout the year, even if it's just seasonal, right? If you're like, it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But you got to go deeper than that. And that's why I say life experiences. I was able to identify of all the hundreds and hundreds, possibly capped over a thousand people that I've worked with, whether it was for one session or five years straight, you learn something from every session, every interaction. Yep. And when someone's going into a field, 
no matter what your field is, uh, professional, trade, whatever, I always like to ask and kind of produce those questions of exploration of what type of work do you prefer to work independently? Do you want to be part of a team? Do you like to work with adolescents, children? Do you prefer working with adults? Do you prefer working with older adults? What setting do you absolutely not want to be in at all? And it's through different jobs that we get exposed to independent work, teamwork, team projects, working with young, older. Like for me personally, I, I you know, I'm selfish about it mm-hmm. with intention, but I will not work with anyone typically under the age of around 27, 28 years old. Um, you know, and I don't say, hey, how old are you when they call me? Um, but I do have my my marketing uh, agenda and strategy of these are the life experiences I want to work with. And typically yes. that's what's coming in. There's more people who are in their 30s, 40s and up um, that have uh, family members with mental health conditions and experiences and there are younger crowd, right? So I'm already able to kind of filter that out. But I always say be selfish with intention. Understand why you do and do not want something because that will provide you clarity to better kind of dictate what you want in and out of your your life. It sounds like who you like to work with is the helpers. Like, you want to work with the family members of people that have issues, right? You want to work with, um, you know, people that are becoming therapists and opening up their private practices. There seems to be an allure for you into helping the helper be a better helper. Oh, that's my whole life. Like, I want everyone to enjoy their time here. I want everyone to do their best. I don't ever feel like I'm in competition with anybody, even in my own field, because everyone's experience is differently. Even if you're doing the same thing, your experience is going to be different. It's like um, even with horoscopes, for example, right? There's yep. that famous little, um, you can find it, it was probably in the 80s or the early 90s that a professor um, wrote, said that he was bringing in everyone's individual horoscope and he was going to pass them out to the class. And th- it's all taped and the class reads their horoscopes and their oohs and ahs and no way. And this is so me, I connect with this. And he said, okay, Okay, now take your horoscope and swap it with the person next to you. And it was the same horoscope. It doesn't matter what you're reading. Interesting. Or what you're seeing. Yeah. You internalize it based on your own beliefs, your memories, your experiences. And to each their own, we can see the same 60 second clip of a movie. And we're both going to experience it differently from what we remember, what they were wearing to the content of the discussion, we're going to connect with things differently. We're going to hear things differently. We're going to remember what we heard differently. It's just sure. astounding. I could, I could do experiences like ex- experiments like that all day, but back to what you were saying, yeah. I love people to do their best. I want people to enjoy their work, enjoy their life. When you can cut back a little bit to be able to enjoy yourself, say no to the invite, say yes to the invite right? It depends on what you want. If you need to just settle down and kick back on the couch, do that for you. Recharge. Say no for six months if you need to. Do what you need to do so that when you go out about your day, you feel content. You feel at peace with, I I know tonight when I get out of work, I I can kick back and relax. Or I know when I'm done with work, I'm going to that dinner, that dinner outing. What do you think is one of the biggest barriers for people really engaging in that level of self-care for themselves and seeing themselves as somebody to be selfish about? I think it's the pressure of family relying on family. I think that there's unspoken and spoken expectation about what we are to do and what we shouldn't be doing or what we could do more of or less of both leisure and professionally. And I think that ourselves, and especially if you're in a committed relationship with a partner, that there's a lot of pressure, even if it's unspoken that you're living up maybe to the expectation of the other person. Where can my listenership find you? And, and you know, what, what do they want to find? What do you want them to find? Yes, please. Mm-hmm. I've definitely been spending a lot of time on Instagram the past couple of years. And that is where I house all of my, my quotes, my sharings, if you will, about mm-hmm. the book. I like to share little clips about different content in the book. Um, and I just love to have discussion. I love feedback. I love to interact and engage with anyone who's interested in what it is that I'm interested in, right? So please um, feel free to find me on Instagram at Hannah Brittany. Uh, but so my middle name is Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H. 
B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y. And follow me on there and interact with me. Please follow me, find me, give me tips and suggestions, and I will run with it. Awesome. And just so you know, I also will put links on all of my notes for the Thank podcast you. so people can go straight to those notes and link to um, to your Instagram account so that they can find you. And if you, the pocket guide, your book, if you want us oh. to put a link there, we can do that. Oh, I as love well. that. Yes, yeah. it's paperback, ebook, and audio. So all three are available through Amazon. I would love that. I'm so appreciative of you. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. And I want to be able to give them that resource because it's, it, a very valuable one. And like you said, very digestible, short, sweet, to the point, has really great information in a concise little little pocketbook. I love that. I, I hadn't even thought of that because you could put it in your back pocket. I like Literally. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, lovely okay. conversation. And gosh, it's just so funny to me to connect with somebody who's so on the same <laughs> wavelength it's when so it comes to though. self-care. I love it. It is. It's so fun to talk to uh, like-minded people. And I, I mean, I, you and I met on the internet. So like I am doing these interviews and I have really just kind of reached out into the world and started to ask people to come in and do these interviews. And it's always so fun to me to find people that I've never met before. Right. I've yes. never worked with you prior to this or anything. Um, and, and no, like we are kind of joint minded. There's another interview that I've done and you and I, um, I shared that one with you, but she had mentioned, I think at the end of it, something to the effect of like, it's so cool to know there are other people from a different industry yes. working honestly towards the same goals. Cause they're so important to, you know, keep in mind and to help, um, empower women to be the best versions of themselves in this world. And your book, I think is more general in that it could be for anybody, but mm -hmm. it, you know, she and I had in, um, in common that we both served women. And I just think it's so important. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brittany, for coming on the show. Well, I love your approach, Dr. Natalie. And again, just thankful for your space sharing it with me today. Yeah. And I look forward to following you and everything that you've been doing. It's great. Just great to see. So wasn't that just lovely? And isn't she just lovely? Such a sweet woman. And so many things that we're doing that are in alignment. Uh, I couldn't, I mean, obviously the name Selfish is the New Selfless. That was my favorite. And I do hope that you click the link in the notes and go and look at her book and certainly start to follow her on Instagram because she has a ton to teach you. And she's dropping little nuggets all the time with her videos and quotes. So please make sure that you are a recipient of all of that wisdom that she has to share with you. She likes to help the helpers, as you heard in our podcast today. So I think that fits you, my friends. Everybody that follows me is somebody that's helping others in their lives. Because what I like to do is help women, especially women in midlife, who have their hands in all the pots, because if I can lift you up, then you're going to lift all of us up. I know that you're helping all of us in all the places that you're at. And I hope that you enjoyed this and that this too has helped you learn to love your story. All right. So I'm adding a little addition here. It's the legal stuff. Just so you're aware, nothing in any of these podcasts constitutes actual psychotherapy. Yes, I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Minnesota, but everything here is just educational in nature and is a suggestion of things that you could be doing in your own life to learn how to love the life that you're in instead of waiting for a life that you're dreaming of to come towards you. So just remember, this is not therapy. And if ever you need any resources for mental health, look in my notes and I'll always have a little blurb at the bottom where you can click on a link and get those services for yourself.